So yeah, I'm Kat. I'm just thrilled that you all are here to weave with me. Um, I'm excited because weaving intuitively is obviously my wheelhouse, my jam. Um, it's really fun to be able to share it with people and what that means. Um, yeah, so I just want to talk a tiny bit about my practice. So you might be able to see I'm teaching this from my studio in Kingston in Midtown. And um, this is, there's some sculptures I'm working on in the background. And what I predominantly do these days is fiber art. And I like that as a uh, kind of a catch-all or a, um, for me, it just works because I mainly do kind of weird things, but with fiber. So I am super drawn to material. I'm really drawn to um, things that are a little bit different outside of the box, I would say. So um, for some people, some people order the materials box, which I'll be going over. And if you didn't, you can always DM me afterwards and I have extra materials so I could hook it up if you wanna buy one. Um, but I am just, in my practice, I'm very materials driven and inspired. And a lot of my work is inspired by um, how the body processes trauma and how we heal from that or how we hold it. And so a lot of my pieces are these sort of bodily limb-like forms, but they're abstracted versions. So they're not too, they're visceral, but they're not too icky. Um, and I'm always trying to play with that line in my work, the line between attraction and repulsion, because we all have this sense memory um, with cloth and with textile. And so I like to kind of manipulate this language that already exists. Um, so yeah, so today, tonight, whichever time of day it is for you, wherever you are, welcome. And we are going to have a lot of fun. So I'm gonna dive in and then I'll talk more about my philosophy and what, I, what I'm into um, as we weave together. But um, so basically I'm gonna be doing an unboxing video for the first few minutes. I don't know if anyone's gone down the rabbit hole of these types of YouTube things, but I have, um, <laughs> so, so here I go. So um, whoever got the box, I sent a bunch of things. First of all, we have our, our loom. So here it is. Uh, thank you to Ashley of Black Sheep Goods. So what I love about this loom um, and again, if you don't have the box, it's cool because I'm going to be touching on like just why I chose these certain things and I think it's interesting and hopefully important. Um, so this loom is great because it's the size of it. It's so portable and it's almost like my um, a sketchbook for weaving. So a lot of the times what I'm doing is not pattern specific. It's just sort of um, it's intuitive. So I'm doing taking either a feeling or an idea from my practice and trying to translate it into uh, fiber. So I love the portable size of this. So people who've had that material pack box have that. Um, here it is all open. Um, so now the other material I sent is, this is uh, raw cotton. And I think this is pretty fun. So it kind of looks like roving. But you could find this probably, um, well, you can find anything on the internet. <laughs> so, so you would find it there. Or um, this is from like a cotton supplier, actually, that reached out to me. But um, just like there's still inclusions from the plant itself in there. And I just find, here, I'll put it under here, too, so you can see. Um, I think it's just fascinating, the, just the variation and how it's kind of strange. Um, so along those lines, I also included some traditional roving, which is these are actually so everything I put in the box was from my studio collection. So everything has either come from a project or something I eyed myself and wanted to use for a project. Um, so this is the the detritus from some roving that I used for a large felted piece and it's all different golds and whites and what I like about it afterwards you know in roving it comes in these beautiful round bushy balls <laughs> but like for this it's a uh, you can see it's all kind of been matted together but for our purposes it's going to be much more interesting has much more character to it um, so don't throw stuff out basically is going to be a lot of the thesis of what I'm talking about um, another thing I included are these amazing raw sheep locks. So you can also get these anywhere. Um, this breed of sheep, I think it's Caracool? No, I remember, I'm, I was just looking up that sheep breed. But uh, and like, somebody was like, oh, it looks like Chewbacca, you know? So this is also an interesting point about material is it can skew 
kind of a cartoonish uh, Muppet like way if you're not careful. But if you do use it um, appropriately, then it can have a really strong presence in your work. So I kind of gave this as a challenge, but also the color is really beautiful. Um, let's see, what else is in there? Oh, this is fun. Um, <laughs> deer skin. So this is a scrap of, um, I work with this book binding leather supplier and they often sell the splits which are the remnants of the leather that is too thin for them to use to sell to people um, to do book binding but for me as an artist it's just so beautiful that you can get um, these that one this material doesn't go to waste from the animal but also that it's available for us to use for our purposes um, okay so let's see what else we've got Oh, I included some some wheat. Um, so I'm, maybe people have really have seen that you can use um, uh, natural materials you might have seen on Pinterest or in real life, uh, people weaving with flowers and things like that. So that's definitely um, a really fun element to include dried flowers or fresh flowers. Uh, another material that I use a lot in my work, which you might see, is this starched linen, and it's called mull. Um, and what I really love about it is it has a stiffness to it because it's like a starched open weave linen, but it still adds some transparency. So a lot of the time I use this as almost a template, and sometimes I leave it in um, because I like the balance within the work. But um, uh, sometimes I take it out <laughs> and it creates a nice space. Uh, then here's your more classic um, yarns, you know, but if you look at these, I think it's a really beautiful, of course I think it is, but I'm allowed to say that because it's my workshop. I think it's a really beautiful palette of interesting material. Um, but what's especially cool is that most of these came from like Michael's. So I also wanted to show people that you can find really beautiful, interesting material that isn't just hand spun or super expensive because um, of course I love using the really good stuff, but you don't have to. You can still make really beautiful work with um, simple techniques and with simple materials or materials that you kind of scrounge for. Um, so like in the back here, I don't know if you can see, but there's like pantyhose like stuffed with polyfill on the back wall. And um, what's one of the sculptures I made that people are like, oh my God, that's like crazy, which is, of course, I want people to think that. But at the same time, I also want people to know that it's kind of a manipulation of an everyday item, um, which anybody can do as long as you, you know, you have the concept behind it and it, it all fuses together. Um, here's also some interesting yarn, which was just from Michael's too, which is was all braided together, but I like how you can untwist it. Um, there's, so there's actually a little bit of polyester in here. I don't always hate that because it has, it adds some sheen. So if there's not, if there's just a little bit, then it can be, it can be pretty, um, it can be nice actually. And the other thing I added was some scraps of muslin. These are from a fashion program um, at Marist College, shout out to Marist. And uh, they gave me all of these bags of scraps of material. And we all probably have clothes that we don't want to wear anymore or, um, you know, things maybe just off, off like scraps that you don't want. Um, so I, I would just recommend even like stripping this like they used to do for medieval, whatever, bandages. <laughs> I'm a history nerd, so that's probably going to come up. So I'm outing myself as one, a really goofy person, which doesn't always come across on the gram, and also um, a history nerd. So newsflash. All right. Um, <laughs> so anyway, that's the, those are the materials that I included. So I hope that who, oh, also I forgot, how could I forget? Um, which people were probably a little frustrated with, but I think it's beautiful if you look at the screen here. Um, these are wood shavings from a woodworker friend of mine. Sadly, not Allison, but another person. <laughs> so, um, but I just thought they were, they reached out to me and they were like, would you ever want to be able to use these? And I haven't used them yet, but I think they're really interesting, the natural curls. And if you soak them, I think they become more pliable. Um, and you can dye them and you can paint them. And um, so I also liked 
how I put them in the box just sort of free with the other materials. And I did that sort of knowingly that things would sort of combine. And um, I just wanted it to be like a very small gesture or reference to like, it's okay. Like if detritus and your war your materials are kind of getting um, combined together, like just kind of go for accident, see what happens. Maybe it's going to be really beautiful and those flaws are where are going to make your work. Okay, so now that I've talked about materials, I'm going to review warping up your loom, which a bunch of people may know, but I'm going to talk about my, uh, the one rule that I like to follow with weaving as I'm doing it, so you can see me do that, and then we'll get to the fun part of the um, weaving intuitively and weaving organic shapes, which I'm going to show you my signature technique, so. Um, so if you did get the materials, you got this little, oh, it's so beautiful. My business card. Oh my God, what a coincidence. Um, <laughs> so this is, these are some of the, this is a picture of the sculptures that I typically, the large scale stuff that I do. Oh, how do I do that? Okay. But anyway, um, moving on, if you un, if you have warp and you're, you don't have the materials box, get it ready next to your loom. You also want to have, I included this tapestry needle. So the Black Sheep Goods comes with a really adorable tapestry needle. I recommend putting it on a necklace and wearing it because um, it's not the most convenient, but it, you could make it work. But I, this is my favorite tool. Okay, hold on, I'm getting used to the camera. For weaving, um, I love a needle. I don't even use a tapestry beater. I don't use a shuttle. Uh, which if you're new to weaving, it's that wider, hold on a second. Um, I got, I have some really beautiful shuttles. So this is a shuttle. So um, you would wrap your yarn and thread around that. Oh yeah, here That's, we go. Yeah, there we go. Perfect. Um, so you would wrap your yarn and thread around here and you'd pass it through the warp, which is the vertical thread that we're going to put onto the loom. So I, get rid of that. Um, so <laughs> what you want is a needle, okay? And I could go on about that, but I'll have to set, set up another workshop just to talk about my favorite needles. But there's, this is a basic one. Um, I think a lot of people who got the materials box got a bent tip tapestry needle. So the very tip is bent. Um, but so what's great about that is you can really use it to pick up the warp to get your material through. And we're gonna use this as an extension of your hand. Um, it's really, going to give you extra control. So if you're familiar with my work, um, I think one of the things that sets it apart is the detail and which is kind of, you know, shows my madness and my obsession. But so you can do it too. You just need use a needle and just get really fine and delicate with what you're doing. Um, I also love a six inch metal tapestry needle. I really recommend that. You can get them on Amazon. That's another brilliant tool because you can almost use it uh, to get further across the warp threads if you are used to using a shuttle or um, something like that. So now let's get warping. So everybody get your thread ready. Um, and I'm going to switch to the screen here. So if you're unfamiliar with warping, what the most important thing is to keep the tension stable, um, keep the tension, be just be mindful of the tension the whole time you're doing it. Of course, after you tie a knot. So what you're first gonna do is tie two square knots on top of each other um, on the upper left corner. Also my accent is you're gonna hear my very strange accent coming out here. Okay, uh, let's say corner. All right, here, we're gonna tie this knot here, double knot. All right, so see what you're gonna do is use one hand. Let me show back to my uh, face here. So I'm gonna, maybe it's easier. I think this part might be easier for me to show you here. So what I'm gonna do is I always, I always am holding my two, and this may be basic, but I think just knowing this is very helpful to keep, keep in mind. Um, so even when you're warping up, you wanna keep the tension of how you're holding the loom and your tension on this thread like equal. So almost not like you're not so stiff that you're going to like, you know, send an arrow shooting somewhere, but you don't want it to be like loose. You know, you want to kind of keep, see this thread. It's not slack. So um, with that in mind, you are going to come down around the bottom 
left corner there, and you're staying all on one side of your loom. And if the warp thread falls down to the ground, don't stress about it, it'll be fine. Um, so now I'm coming down here, and you're looping behind, these are called the teeth of the loom, or I call them that. Um, so you're going behind, I don't know, so you can see, yeah. Another thing is you can, I like to use the maximum space. So I like to warp the entire thing. You can also warp it up just so that the warp thread is covering the open square of the loom. So just keep I, going back and forth like this. And it's like, oh, well, she's warping it up. This looks really basic, but look at, look at the elbow placement. Look at, <laughs> look at the tension, the beautiful tension. The, the reason why, okay, so I'm gonna anchor this now. Can you hear? It's like a little bit of a twang. You want that, you want, it's like you're making a homemade instrument. You want to keep the tension even um, the whole time. And I am a huge rule breaker, especially when it comes to weaving. Um, I have, as you've heard, two graduate degrees, but I actually took up weaving um, after grad school. And one of the things I loved about it was that I came to it, I had all this training in disciplines and other fields, so I knew how to approach a new skill, but I was able to really take freedom and try new things with weaving. Um, but the one rule I agree with is that you should always maintain even tension when you're warping up your loom because if this is if this is too loose and then you're trying to put kind of crazy stuff in there it's not gonna be structurally sound and it's not gonna hold up so um and if you have to move your other hand for a reason just always make sure you anchor the end of your warp thread so i'm like mm, you know um so go behind Kat, um, Anna asks if you're double warping. It looks like you're not, but just confirming. Yeah, I'm just single warping just on one side. So good question. So if you were double warping, you could go all the way the front. So this is the front, this is the back. So you could go kind of like this around and I'm all front facing. So I'm just kind of scooting across the front. Um, so we're gonna keep going like this. And when you get to the, the last tooth, you want to tie uh, two more knots there as well. And this will be the true test if I sent everybody enough warp thread. <laughs> so that would be an interesting surprise. Um, so here we go. I'm almost there. Here we go. So then I'm gonna, before I really tie it off, I'm gonna make sure this is anchored and then Hear that sound, so nice. Okay, so I'm, I'm happy with that, it's great. Okay, so now what I'm gonna do is tie off, so this is a little trickier, always anchor the bottom, the last thread, and um, take your thread and loop it under the last one. Yeah, can you do that a little closer to the screen? Yeah, I'm, do it. I'm gonna do this part under the camera. All right, here we go. So this is, it's a little trickier at the end. All right, I have one knot down. So now I'm gonna go back through underneath the last thread and do the square knot on, on top. Um, Great. There's a part that CB would like you to show again. Sure. Um, I think they were maybe confused about the warping up. CB, do you want to unmute yourself and ask a question? Yeah, feel free to ask. Yeah, I am just confused about which way the rope is going or the string. Okay, sure. Yeah, so um, you want to go from top down to the next corner. It's like a connect the dots. So I started, hold on, sorry. I started at this corner and uh -huh. then I go down to this one. So I went behind. And then you, and then you, you go wrap around the teeth at the back and not all the way. Up. Exactly, yeah. 
And these are uh, shallow teeth. So if you get into weaving and you want to, um, other looms that are, you know, a little more sturdy, these are long, deeper, longer. So it's not quite so precarious getting. This is like a real, it's like you're starting out in the blue square if you've ever skied or whatever, you know, like you're, you're not starting out easy. So uh, respect to everybody for learning on here. Yeah. When you warp your large loom, let's see, what is it? Um, can I just, sh uh, let me. Yeah. Okay, sorry, I'm somewhere public, so I have to wear a mask oh, cool. a little bit. <laughs> but so you're just wrapping it around. That's right. Up here and then down and around and back up. That's right, perfect. Okay, sorry, thank you. No problem, it's good, good question. Yep, great. And um, Rachel asks, when you warp your large looms, is it one continuous warp strand or do you warp it in sections and then tie it off along the way? Good question. Um, you could definitely do both. I try to warp from one continuous thing. So um, I buy these really big warp. This isn't even warp. This is, well, it's crochet thread. So if you've ever been to Michael's or Joanne's or just online, it's called Aunt Lydia's crochet number 10 um, is the thickness that I like. And this is, it's basically, it's mercantilized cotton, which means like machine made, um, but it's super strong. Sometimes if you get to the middle of a cone, it, it's, you know, knotted, they knotted it together at the factory or whatever, but typically I can warp up my six by six foot loom with this and it's okay. Um, although fun fact, if you, if your warp breaks and you have to tie it together, that's where the, t the term weaver's knot comes from. So now you know. Any other questions? Not so far. All right, cool. So let's get weaving. <laughs> All right, so if anybody has, or everybody hopefully, um, has some kind of yarn that is about this thickness, let me see where it is. So this is the one, if you have the kit, um, this was the one that had like the most material. It's just a very standard yarn. Um, and let me find, so what you're gonna do is I'm gonna, I don't like to use the whole material at once. So I'm gonna do like two arm lengths of it. So one, <laughs> two. Okay, so then you're gonna cut that down. I chose scissors that don't work. Here we go. So you're gonna thread your needle. And I actually, I do tie knots in my yarn onto the needle. I do. So the first thing we're gonna go over is uh, the tabby stitch. So again, if you've woven before, you know this stitch but this is pretty much the only one that I use. Um, I know how to do all the other ones, you know, um, there's some really fun, interesting things, but I guess I just wanna underscore how much one can do with just one, the simple stitch, the, which is just the basic under over um, stitch and weaving. So I'm gonna show you that because that is the way that I do the organic weaving of the shapes. So when you're weaving, um, you want to go over one warp thread and under the next. So you go over, under, over, under, over, under, follow the tip of your needle. You, when you get through one needle length, I pull it through a little bit so that, okay, it's coming there. You're gonna go all the way across with this first thread. We're just gonna do uh, two rows of basic back and forth and then I'm going to move on to the organic shape. Okay so once you get through there you are going to pull it through so you have about six to twelve inches of a tail sticking out one side. As you get more comfortable with weaving you can leave a lot shorter tail but this is essentially um, what you, I'm, that's a little bit excessive, okay. <laughs> this is what you're gonna either tie off later in the back of your piece. So you, if you know, oh, I can tie, I can tie like a two inch, a knot out of a two inch piece of material, then leave two inches, that's fine. But otherwise leave this much maybe. 
Um, okay, so now we're gonna do the technique called bubbling, which is you use your needle to push down the material and kind of make these arcs. The reason we do this in weaving is because it helps maintain the tension. Uh, so, so it looks kind of, feels kind of weird right now because there's nothing else on there, but as you're weaving up, if you just pulled your thread straight across every row, then you would get an hourglass shape. Now it's good to know because maybe you wanna make a series of pieces that are hourglasses. And I have pushed a flaw in pieces before to make really interesting work. So don't think that it's necessarily wrong, but um, maybe just save it for later, okay? So, uh, so now we're gonna push down these bumps, lumps, and you kind of wanna use, you can, because again, this is um, the first row, you can kind of play with it, just use your fingers, it's okay. The second row is where the bubbling technique is really gonna help more. Um, so when we go back the second row, you want to do the opposite of what you just did. So you want to go, if I did over under, I want to go under over. Whoops, hold on, I'm, something's rolling at me. <laughs> All right, so we are weaving over under, over under, and then I'm gonna switch and show you in a second why this is important. Okay, so before you pull, I'm gonna show back up on me again, so I can. Okay, so before you get really excited, which I know you will be, and pull it all the way through, um, another element to maintaining nice tension throughout your, <laughs> your piece is that you, I call this the elbow of your yarn. So you want the elbow to not pull in this outer warp thread at all. So you basically just want this elbow to gently touch this outer one. So um, again, it's tempting with weaving to like really pull it in. So we want to leave it so that this, the warp threads stay vertical. So here I'm gonna get find the end of my needle. And look, I can do this backwards and reverse. Okay. So we got the, we wanna do some bumps here. See, we got the bumps. This is like pulling in a little bit. So you're gonna use your needle to come down like this. Oh, nice. So you just see the tension is even throughout. So pleasing. Okay, so now I'm going to use my fingers, and you you'll get a feel for this, like what feels right. You know, look at that; it's pretty good. Okay. <laughs> Everybody, just be excited. This is this now. It's happening. All right. Okay. So now I'm going to teach you my organic shape technique. Let's get down to the brass tacks. Okay. Hold on. I'm moving this. Okay. So what I do for um, tapestry, tapestry weaving organic shapes, if you're familiar with weaving at all, a lot of times they tell people to um, weave, create your shapes from the bottom, from the bottom up. That's not what I do. I'm gonna, we're gonna do the opposite. We are going to essentially weave in um, a third tabby stitch row here. So just like we did the other two times, get your needle and your yarn all the way through. But don't worry about the bubbling right now because we're gonna manipulate this line. Just get it through there. Okay. Pulling through. Go. All right, I've set my, my camera set up under a stool, so I'm running into the leg underneath here. Okay. Um, all right, so see this beautiful art. Now I'm already doing it intuitively. I can't help myself. Okay, so what you're gonna do is you are going to use your needle and still hold, keep an eye on this elbow right here. So as I'm manipulating this line, 
to create a beautiful organic arc. I don't, I still don't want this to pull this in because it's going to make things tricky for us later on. So just be mindful of that. So see, I just kind of fixed it. It's good now. And the thing with this technique is that you are going to have to keep adjusting it while, you, as you're going. Um, it's kind of a constant readjustment. So I actually really like what I just created. Um, so see how essentially I wove my tabby stitch line across. I used my needle. I'm going to use my needle to sort of create the shape that I want. Now, when you're creating organic shapes, you want to do it uh, more exaggerated than it will be in your head. Um, because as you're weaving, the shapes are going to contract. And so you have to be mindful of that. So it's like if I, if I want it kind of to be like this, then I might make it, you know, bigger slightly. Um, and just play to like where it feels right. This is really part of that. You want, I like um, constantly playing with asymmetry and till it feels balanced. Um, and the other thing to know is we are going to then weave back across following this line. So we're not going to weave starting from back down here. We're going to come up and, and follow the arc here, which is going to kind of mess with our tension a little bit, but it's all for, for good. <laughs> so just trust me. Okay. All right. So everybody get your needle back through. I'm going to come, I think I'm, I don't know, this looks too bumpy now. I want it to look more like a mountain, but I'm going to come down here because I know that to fill it in, it's going to take a long time. Okay. And Kat, is it possible to slow down just a tad on the pace for like a little bit? Sure, happy to. Um, yeah, yeah. Well, how's everybody doing? Applause. <laughs> Does anyone want to show Cat what they've okay. got so far? Whoops. Ooh, nice. Look at that. Great. Uh, yes. Susan, Anna. <laughs> yes. Everybody's doing it. Right. Awesome. Looks like Nick got some good stuff going on. Great. Yes, I see. Okay, great. Everybody's got their arcs. Perfect. Okay. Great. And this is where, I don't know, it gets really fun. Like, so if you know, through so traditional tapestry weaving, um, you have a cartoon, which is like a sketch of what you're trying to weave behind the loom. And your loom is usually upright. And then you kind of fill in like Tetris a little bit, like bottom up in the, and you, you can only use, cause essentially the warp is like a grid. So if you're weaving traditionally, um, you have to weave like this, you know, whether it's like at right angles. Are you leaving the loops on each side each time? Uh, uh, yes. On the edges of it here, let me see. On each side. Where are you? Leaving the loops on the, I'm leaving the loops on each time I'm weaving through here. On each end, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Let's, uh, let's go ahead and fill that back in now. All right, great. So now come back in from, here I am here, okay. So this is the edge. As you fill in your shape from top down, what you want to do is go only needle length by needle length. So when you're working within this area to fill it in, you don't want to bring your yarn all the way across the width of the shape. You want to go bit by bit because you'll be able to better manipulate the shape that you just did. Look at these, there's little bitty pieces of wood getting in my piece here. <laughs> Okay, so here is, here is that elbow and I, I'm going to come up 
I'm pushing my yarn. You also have to kind of keep feeding it back to yourself in this, in this way of working. So I need more yarn to come back to, to fully fill in along this underneath of this arc. So see now I can push it up under there. Look, it's starting to come together. Okay, so now I'm gonna use my needle and I'm gonna adjust it again, oh, just a little bit. Okay, look, so this is where we should be. So now that was only one needle length of thread um, into the warp, back into the warp here. So now I'm like, okay, that's good. It's staying for the time being. I'm gonna go another needle length and do that. So I'm coming and I'm just gonna keep showing you so then it'll um, click a little bit and then we can, after I do this one row again, then we can have questions, okay? So here I'm bringing this through and you can probably see why. So you couldn't do these organic shapes with a shuttle. You have to use a needle. You have to use something that you have a lot of dexterity with and manipulation. All right, so see, I kind of got it through there. It looks like enough. I'm going to push this up here. So you can continually, so say, oh, I want to change my arc. That's fine, as long as you give yourself enough slack with the bit of material that you're using. So look, I'm like, no, I want this to go up here. So I'm just going to push it into place. Um, and then being ever mindful of this, you know? <laughs> making sure this isn't pulling, this elbow of yarn isn't pulling on the outer warp thread too much. So I'm gonna use this to bring it down. It's kind of easier sometimes to move two or three rows of material to get that outer shape that you really are going for. Okay, so look, it's happening. This is my, these are my trademark secrets, guys. Okay. <laughs> All right, so let's go another needle length across. How many does it take here? This is why I like the six inch needle because it kind of feels like cheating. You get to go farther. But for learning purposes, the shorter needle makes us address smaller surface areas, um, which is smart. All right. For somebody who does such labor intensive work, I do love a shortcut. Okay, so. <laughs> All right, so we're gonna put, see, and I'm, I'm just sort of using my needle still to push it, the yarn. You wanna just make sure that this bit of yarn that's the, where the excess material is coming from is able to feed into your piece as you're weaving. So, and then look, there's a little bit of a gap here. Okay, I'm gonna go back and fix that a little bit. Of course, as we weave this shape, if we, if we decide to continue weaving organic shapes on top of it, anything we weave will, will compress down. And even if we keep the tension beautiful and it's all nice, it's going to, it's just natural, it's what happens. So that's part of the intuition, the go with it, make it work phase. All right, so now I'm back, I'm at this final elbow here. Ooh. So I'm here like, what do I do? Do I go all the way? So this is what you have to decide. It's a personal choice. Um, I'm gonna come up onto the elbow and pull my material through and then decide what I wanna do. And this is, a, this is recorded too. So if you guys wanna go back and reference this, you'll have access to this, which is good to know. Um, so it's like, okay, so here's a choice I can make in this corner. I can push it together and not take my extra material back onto this warp thread. Or I can, you know, make it bigger and know that I have, I'm gonna have to loop over here because if I came back from this thread this way, there would be a hole, which we don't really want. Maybe you do want that and then that's fine. But for our purposes, I don't know. I'm not into it. All right. So we're filling this in. And if things shift, that's okay. Just use your needle, kind of push things back a little bit. Now I'm coming back for my third row. The first two rows are really the ones that, where you can really manipulate your shape because the more rows that you get in there, the more the tension will be predicated on the row before so you won't be able to shift and manipulate things quite as much. You can still, 
but um, you have less wiggle room, literally and metaphorically, as you weave. So I'm going to come in here. All right, so here, look, I've come here. Here, it's touching just there. I need to get a little more material. I'm pulling back. Then I'm going to push up. I usually push the material then up into the where there, there's the biggest vertical space. So to make sure that it's going to be okay. And work, you work bit by bit across. So I'm like, okay, this looks evenly filled in. I'm going to adjust this slightly. See? Then I have a little excess here. I'm going to bring it around. You have to leave a little excess in to be able to round out the bumps, the humps and lumps, whatever you want to call them. <laughs> All right. So this is getting a crooked, so I'm fixing that. This. There. Look how nice. Okay. So we're continuing to go across. leaving and everybody as we're going if you are having questions feel free to just drop them in the chat box and we'll either call them out now or save them for later definitely okay i'm just still filling in these peaks that's a better word <laughs> okay not humps and lumps. Humps and lumps and bumps, you know. Peaks and valleys sounds a little classier, I guess. <laughs> Depends on your peaks. Okay. Um, look at that. It's happening. I hope. Let me see. Let's have a let's have a look. See at everybody else. Let me. Uh, <laughs> anybody else having uh, success? Oh, good. Very good. Perfect. Yes. And, um, what do we do when our length of yarn runs out? Aha. So you, you can get um, another piece. And what I recommend is weaving um, wherever your, the end of your piece of yarn ended. So like when it gets down to like six to 12 inches, leave that, the tail, the new tail that you've just created back, leave, hanging back through the back of your loom. So I'll just do that here so you can see. So it's like, pretend that this is run out. Let's go back to here. Where am I? Okay. Pretend it's like, oh no, it's, it's done in the middle. Look at my acting skills. Okay. So <laughs> you just come back. See how I just dropped my needle through the back? It's through the back. Here it is coming out the back. Cut it. Or maybe it's, it's run out so you don't have to do that. And then you thread your needle with the new material or the same material. And you just start weaving again. Pretend that this is continuing from the thread. Behind. So you, if this thread you just finished ended behind your loom, your new thread would start coming from behind. So pretend this is the same, this one is the same as that. So then you go over under whatever the pattern was for that row you want to keep it consistent. And I'll show you in a sec. So yeah, you should have these two hold on. These two tails. Ta-da. And then um, just continue weaving. So you can hide where those tails are as you get to the next row. So here I am at the next row. Using your needle to manipulate it. See, look, I can't even see. Perfect. Erin, does that, does that answer your no. question? Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so you can also physically tie it to your new piece if you want, your new piece of material. Um, if you have run out and you want to use a different material, you can also take your piece back to the end of the previous row 
and leave your material, your yarn, um, hanging out the back or out the side. And later when you're finished, you would weave it in. So you can, you can at any point switch material. Um, every time you change the thickness of your material, it will affect the tension of your piece, which I like to push. So now once you know the language of tension and what good tension is, um, you can know that to use different, incorporate different materials and different thicknesses of yarn is going to alter the shape of your piece. It's gonna give it more, honestly, more texture. It's gonna give it three dimensionality because it will not want to lay flat because the different thicknesses are competing with that tension on the warp. Um, so if you're doing traditional tapestry weaving, which I think you've gotten by now, this is not traditional. Um, then you'd want all the yarn to be the exact same thickness. Like if you ever see like those classical studios, that's what they have. And um, they have the bobbins. And if you had yarn that was even slightly thicker than the other, it would buckle. There would be buckling. It would not be what you would want. Um, but if you're weaving in this organic freestyle way, you can know that, but then kind of use it to push it to incorporate more texture, more um, animation basically into your flat piece. And what I love about weaving is that it, it, it yes, it's flat technically, but it's not really, a, it's like three dimensional masquerading is two dimensional, um, like mode of working. So don't forget that because you can, you can make choices that will push it in certain directions. All right. Here we are. So depending on how high, so say this is another trick if you run out of material. If I'm making a commission for somebody and I am running out of material in a section um, uh, and I don't have any more and it needs to look the same, you can always push your whole shape down. So just, just make it work. So it's like, oh, Crap, I need to make this fix. Okay, I'm gonna go down here. This is also just good to know if you wanna try another step of something, you know? So look, I'm pushing it. I still have my nice bubbles. See, so I've moved it down. Let's check, let's check out this, the elbow situation. Okay, that still looks great. This one, ugh. okay, let's fix it. There we go. This is a very forgiving um, warp set. And set, S-E-T-T, -T, is the number of warp threads per inch. Um, and so this one is nice because it gives us, it's not too finely set where we would have issues. Obviously, if your warp is closer together, uh, you get more detail in what you're weaving. It's like having more pixels per inch in an image. Um, so yeah, but the good news is if we are, you, there's more room to move things if you, it's less um, detailed. So we are going to fill in these little, so when you get to like, say you get to these little shapes, what is your normal Ooh, Good question. That's a good question. What is it on there? I think it's 16 per inch. It's pretty small um, on the big ones that I use most of the time. So this one, when we get to these little bubble shapes here, you just do what we've been doing, but in a much smaller area. And you just have to judge um, like how far you want to take it. So see this little tiny space? I'm going to go under this one. Pushing it up, pushing it, and then see here I have to make a call. Do I want to come around this warp thread too? No, every time you loop around a, a vertical warp thread, it's gonna add height. So if it's gonna push the shape up too much, I actually wanna make the choice to leave it as it is because I like the way it's undulating here. And I'm going to come, I'm gonna go behind. So I'm gonna come behind the stitch over sneaking across like I'm ducking under 
something, some analogy <laughs> under a table or something. And I'm coming up to the other one. That's a weird analogy. All right. And then <laughs> here I am. Look, I'm in this next little shape. So I'm going to pull my needle into there. So see here, it's like, oh, I've come, I've actually come behind two warp threads, which normally you would not want to do. But I know I'm just going to push this down and it's hidden that I've gone behind. So now here I am in this little shape and I can finish it off nicely and fill it in. See, and then adjusting. So here you can see because of the warp set. So if this warp set were more fine, um, if there were more threads in between, you could get more detailed of a picture, like I said. So, but here we have to make the choice. We can either fill in here or here. So you can either leave this shape up and come weave back across and loop around this warp thread, or you can push it down and decide that's enough of that <laughs> um, and come and finish your shape because you can get um, I think when I first was developing this technique this upside down organic shape weaving I got really excited about it that I could really fill in those tiny holes um, but you can kind of get lose your way in a sense like get obsessed with filling them in because it's like, where does it end? You'll, you'll see what I mean as you get, as you get going down the road. So just be mindful. Don't lose the path. Don't lose sight of the path, guys. Don't, you can get obsessed with filling these holes, but a little bit of gaps, it's okay. Because when we take it off the loom, it's going to uh, contract and it's going to be a different thing anyway. So you can be attached to what you're making on the loom, but I would say, unless you're gonna leave it on the loom, don't be too attached to ever because because we're working with natural materials and with, um, you know, fiber, whether it's organic cotton or animal, um, it has a springiness. It has a um, it has its own tension rules. So when we stretch it on the loom, we take it off. Everything's going to kind of um, move. So it's interesting to be mindful of that. It's kind of fun. I kind of like that um, surprise element of like exactly what's it going to do. I have also re-hung pieces, re-stretched them after I weave them and move them to another, um, to a frame if I want that taut look versus the more organic um, version. Courtney asks if you use the warp as a design element or do you hide it? Good question. Um, it depends on the piece. So there was a blue piece that I did where I left the uh, the top warp thread. It was black warp thread. I left it exposed because I really like the juxtaposition. Um, so that's great. You should be asking yourself these questions. You know, like why not? I let, like ask. Try to ask yourself why not a lot. So like why not leave the warp thread exposed? You know, if it's if it's interesting to what you're doing visually, then you should go for it. And I think um, take risks and try it out. See where it takes you. Anna asked earlier if you always use a loom. Hmm, no, I don't actually. I don't know if you can see if I move. There's this big thing on the ground, <laughs> which is a 20 foot long. Um, I'm calling it a bruise right now. So it's supposed to look like it's the blacks and blues of a bruise before as it spreads before it heals and the color changes. Um, and so that's all in chicken wire, actually. So uh, you can use almost anything as an armature to weave into. So that's an example of that. Um, I, yeah, there's all sorts of different things that you could get creative with. People use just picture frames. That's a really basic one, but you could weave on, there's a chair over there. You could warp up, you could wrap around there. So anything that has like a, an open frame in a sense. So with the chicken wire, I developed that technique with a friend who um, spins a lot of material for me. And we were trying to figure out how we could get the pieces like even more sculptural to come away from the surface of the loom. And so we're trying to think of other structures that are flexible that you can weave into. And so the wire was, chicken wire was one of those um, that we came up with. 
So, because each cell is kind of a little open frame, you know, so you can either tuck or weave or not into that. So you'll, it'll be fun to see what everyone comes up with, I think, after the workshop. Kind of speaking of, Rissa had asked earlier if there are any materials to avoid, I think in terms of like what you might want to be using as additional materials beyond the thing. Okay. I, I have not come across anything yet that I would use. Um, I use like silkworm cocoons and uh, I'm like looking around me because there's always something kind of strange or different that I'm using. I've used um, like even bits of plaster, like you can use anything really. So I think more the question is to be mindful of what the piece is that you're making and um, if it's going to come off the loom, you'd want to know if it's structurally sound, I guess, if that's important to you. If it's not, you might want to find something that you can use as a dedicated frame and really use kind of really different materials in that and um, where you don't have to worry about them staying like cloth-like when you take it off of there. So anything goes really. Yeah. yeah. How is everybody doing so far? Anybody want to show Kat what they're working on? Look at this gallery view here. Carol, yes. Ooh. Susan. Yeah, yeah. beautiful. Yes. It's cool. So you're starting to see. It's just great. Oh, wait. Keep, your, keep yourselves back up. <laughs> <laughs> ah, Elizabeth, Meg. Claire, Aaron, hi. Oh, great. Yes. Anybody surprised by this technique? Like, my, oh, that looks great, CB. Look at that. Yes. Perfect. Love it. Thank so what, what's the time check? Because maybe I'll try showing some other materials, too. Okay. Yes. Um, it is, we've got 20 minutes. Officially. All right. Cool. I will show some of that. So now, so now you have this organic shape. You can continue filling it in, you'll know how to do that. Um, you can see here, see this shape is like nicely filled in. You can see kind of how it's contracted. It's not as exaggerated as it was when I started. So when you continue to do this technique, you can just be mindful of that, that it is going to alter as you are working on it. Um, so yeah, and if you were gonna do another organic shape, you would take a new piece of thread or yarn, re-thread your needle, um, go across the loom and redraw a new line. So for this piece, I might, I would probably draw a line that like is coming down in behind. I often like to use like the rule of thirds. It's a good way to get good balance in your piece. Um, and then fill in your organic shape over here. And this is where the layering of the shapes, you can really add depth in terms of either color, texture, um, if you make lots and lots of these shapes really small, which is something I do in a lot of my pieces, then in different textures, each one is a different texture, you can really add a really interesting um, depth and texture. It's just really interesting how subtle choices can really affect the overall piece. So it doesn't have to be like knowing, having a wheelhouse of like 50 different um, weaving stitches under your belt, you know, like this is just one and you, look what you can do. <laughs> look at yourselves, look at this, it's great. Um, all right, so I'm gonna just play around with some of the material that I gave y'all so that you can see how to play with it. So the locks, God, it's driving me crazy. I just ordered more of this. What is the name of it? I'll think of it. Um, <clears throat> so with the sheep locks, again, the same thing kind of applies as you would do with just with the tabby stitch, with the basic stitch of weaving. You want to um, just use the, this I wouldn't thread on a needle because it's so kind of bizarre. Um, but again, I want to go do the opposite of what my shape before was. So if the shape before was over, under, over, I want to go under, over. I the cool thing about using thicker material is it will kind of hold itself in place. So if we're using like this cotton yarn, also I just have to give a shout out to this yarn. If you guys got the material pack, this is from um, a prop master on a film set that I worked on. He kind of swindled me into buying a bag of, <laughs> of yarn afterwards, but it was a really good price. So anyway, that's kind of a fun fact if you care. If, the, if you have this yarn, it's kind of interesting. 
Um, it came from Hollywood. Okay, so continuing with this fiber. So what I like about the thicker material is that you can really be free with how you use it and um, it'll just stay in place. So this, I don't have to worry about tucking the tail behind the piece. You can just leave it and it'll stay in place. And then I'm gonna go over here and kind of continue to, another cool tool, which you might have on hand if you do other fiber crafts is a, like a rug hook or a crochet hook. That is really great. So see here, I was like kind of struggling to lift the warp thread um, to put this through. If you use like a hook, you can pick up your warp thread more easily to put interesting materials in. So I recommend having that as a fun little tool. Okay, so look here, it's in there. I'm going to tap it in and it's adding already, look at this, some interesting undulation. So you can leave the tail sticking out. You can weave it in so that the tail is going to be behind the piece. So behind the warp thread, then I'm gonna get another one that's thicker and come back around. So see again, I gotta like, you wanna use your fingers to get this through here. Yeah, what if you wanted, would you ever start like higher up um, and not begin a new line again directly on top of what you just did? Good question. I typically wouldn't just because, it's a good question. Um, I guess one, it's because visually, that's how I build the piece is from here, kind of creating the shape and then I know what I want to come over it. The other thing is if I, if I include some material up here, it's going to be much harder to, it's like building the roof of a house first versus like the floors. So it's much harder to put the floors in afterwards, if that makes sense, like because you have to work all within. So if I wove something up here, the tension for all of this is predicated on whatever's up here versus if I'm building up to there, it's kind of you still have free space to play. Um, so you can definitely do that, but it's much trickier as people might be starting to see where when you have to start filling in the little spaces within your organic shape, um, it's much harder to work within these little spaces where you already have a ceiling that's determining the tension of your loom versus if you when you just were drawing that first organic line. And I think this is I think this is a similar question to what I had just asked, but confirming from Aaron that you always have to introduce new material above, like you wouldn't. You can go. put it in, you can get jamming in there, go for it, like, you know. <laughs> yeah, so you can, once you know why you're doing what you're doing, you can bend the rules. So if you want to weave in different sections, you can definitely do that. Um, I think like why I describe why I do it is a good to keep in mind, you know? So, so yeah, say you could add, once you draw your shape of your organic shape, you can fill in the insides with whatever you want. It doesn't have to be the same yarn. It could be this, um, the, ro the, the lock, the wool sheep locks, or it could be um, a different color of material or the cotton here. Look, I'm gonna put some cotton in here. I'm gonna go wild get that in here. So you'll just see it's, it is harder to add material in to a space like that, you know? Do you ever have to worry about tension differently in that little space if you're using different material? Yeah, if you use a different material within the organic spaces, it will, it will see how my shape got a little bit lost when I was doing that, when I was putting it in there. Um, because I was using a different technique, just my fingers, and this is much thicker than the other material. So you can just go back and continually adjust as you're doing that. You just want to always be, have your needle at hand and be able to do that. Also, the thing with weaving, which I love, one of the things, is that you can undo it. So you can try something and take it out, and it's very forgiving. Um, so you can, you can play. And then if it doesn't work, it's not like, oh no, that's it. You know, you can keep going. Ooh, the you show us how to use the wood shavings? Yeah, was, let's see. Okay. okay. So how would you use the wood shavings? That's the question, right? So I would use them honestly the same way as with the uh, 
the sheep locks. So I would just see I'm lifting up my warp thread and they will kind of crumble because it's a little bit of a strange material. But look, you only really have to put that, hold on, I'll keep it flat, through one and it's gonna stay. Um, I would probably try to get these longer tails under another one. So when you're using thicker or strange material, you probably don't want to take it under every warp thread. You can skip. So as long as you're alternating an even amount of warp threads, then it'll be great. So this gets right there. Oops. Yeah, see? Also, if you, um, I don't really do tasseled bottoms anymore, or I don't know, it's not really my style, but you could add all the, ma the material that like this, that's definitely gonna affect your warp and your tension underneath, you know? So you could push your shapes all, push everything up dee -dee -dee, a little bit. And then you could add the stranger stuff down here because there's, again, it gives you more space. And it's not going to, if you affect this tension with the strange material, it's going to still leave this pretty, pretty nice, you know, pretty even. And, and same, asking about um, knotting, thoughts of, around knotting as a technique? Yes, I love to do that in my uh, chicken wire pieces. So you can use your yarn. Um, where is that really cool funky stuff? Here it is. Whoa, look at this. All right, I'm going to take a piece of this. And <clears throat> so you can play on the surface of the loom. So see how you can, you can just invent things. Like, look, it's like, okay, this is cool. I'm going to tie a knot onto the loom. I'm going to go under the next, I'm just making this up as I go. Look at this. You can tie another one. You can do, so look, that's kind of nice because it does, it adds, um, and I've done something like this <laughs> before, but you can just play. And if you do tie knots onto the surface of the loom, it gives you more height, which is pretty interesting. So look, there's that. And then we can push it down and see. Um, I also gave people like monochromatic materials. And in my work, you see that happening a lot. But I do think it's a good exercise to try to work within a palette because then it forces you to really rely on the texture of your materials versus the color. Um, color is beautiful and it's a wonderful element to which we can use to convey emotion. But at the same time, um, you, it's harder to focus on different textures because there's a lot of different colors going on. So even if you want to use color, that's great. Um, but maybe every once in a while, just challenge yourself to work within one single palette and see what happens. Speaking of the wood shaving still, um, Allison's asking how you fix the tension around the stranger materials like wood shavings if you're only using them in the middle. Yeah, you would just be mindful like of the piece. So if I, I just added one in here and it's still pretty okay. Um, if you look at the loom, it's still, see, it's still pretty vertical. And I've added this other kind of strain, um, the thicker yarn um, and things are all right. But if I did add, if I added a whole bunch of wood shavings right here, it would probably bring, bring things in and out a little bit. Part of it doesn't matter quite as much because you're working more towards the center of the piece almost like um, on the body of a plane or something, you know? Like it's, you have, if once the rest of it is sort of even, then you can be a little more, I don't know, outside the box in the middle. Like it's gonna be, it's balanced. The beginning where we started has really locked in the tension for the most part, which is great. That's why I always usually start with a couple of tabby stitches that are straight across before I even draw an organic line. Um, because then it just, keeps things set for you. Also, if the tension does change, it's probably all right too. Yes. Ooh, beads. Um, as, yeah, yeah uh, <laughs> beads. Linda's wanting to know about adding beads. Any tips? Yeah, that's a great idea. Um, so you, you, I would recommend finding beads that fit onto your tapestry needle that you're using. It will just save you a lot of time. 
um, because then what you could do is as you're weaving across the rows, you could just thread a bead onto your needle as you where you want it to go, and then it will just be um, locked into place on your weft. That's the, the stuff that we're putting on the warp, you know, brain hole there anyway. So yeah, that that's super fun. I That would be really cool to see beads on there. And everyone, uh, just a time check, we have about five minutes left. Um, as everyone is continuing to leave, please feel free to stick your questions in the chat box. I have a couple of others in, in waiting. Um, we will not be able to get to all of your questions probably right now, but I will have Kat respond to them in an email that she'll follow up with after. Um, so yeah, please keep, keep your questions coming. Um, yeah. While we are doing questions, I think this one's super important from Kimaya and then relatedly from CB. Um, from Kimaya, how far from the top do you stop weaving so you can take the weaving off the loom? And then from CB, how do you, and Reina, uh, how do you take it off the frame? Good question. All right, so how far from the top? Okay, so let me, I'm gonna pick it up so I can show you. Okay, <clears throat> so I'm like Vanna White here. Okay, so <laughs> so um, you, I, the frame, I usually use the frame of the loom as the border. So I would not, see how I've been weaving above the border here. Um, I would not weave, you don't wanna weave all the way down here. It just creates more of a headache to figure that out. Um, then I would want to stop here at the, the latest. I would even, if again, it goes to like how comfortable you are with tying knots this short in this material. So that's how um, you get it off the loom is you essentially, I'll do it from down here. So you're going to use your fingers or a needle or your crochet hook and take off the loops in pairs. You would do this only once it's finished, obviously. I do all on the bottom or and then the top. So don't do top and bottom because you'll have it at least anchored on the top or the bottom. So as you're taking it off, um, you just wanna, so I'm, I would focus just on the bottom. So I have my two loops. So now what you wanna do, get down here again. This is where it's like macgyver <laughs> It's like you want to take the two loops and tie them into a square knot. So this is the first knot. It's very tempting to really pull it, but you will squeeze up your piece. So just kind of gently. So it's just touching the edge of your material. Then you want to do another knot on top of that. Ta-da, see? So you wanna do that all the way across on the bottom and then you would turn it around and do that on the top and that's how you tie it off. Um, also, if you do have the materials kit, there are great photographs in the handout that came with the loom um, on how to tie it off. And also some other extra like tips about uh, different techniques, so. Thank you. Um, everybody, we have two minutes left, so please keep dropping your questions in the chat box. Um, from, let's see, from Ni oh, from Sophie earlier, um, I noticed in your work that you get a lot of relief and 3D bobbles. Is that only by adjusting the tension or is it woven on the chicken wire or something more rigid? And also super fast from Alicia, um, what was, what's the material called in your piece, Rise? Ah, oh, that's a fun one. So that writhe is sitting back there lurking in the corner, if you can see it. Um, so that material was actually material I made on a sewing machine. So it's um, like a velvet kind of velour microfiber material that I created these tubes um, and I stuffed them with polyfill, polyester filling. It's the greatest acronym. Um, and yeah, and then I knotted them together in all these different ways. So you can create your own material too, uh, which is fun. What was the other question? Um, oh, I lost it. Oh, uh, can, uh, da -da 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 -da. 
you get a lot of relief. Is that oh, what just yeah. texting? Yeah, so uh, one of the pieces I posted maybe a month or so, two ago, um, was an all cream or off-white piece in the technique I showed you with the organic shapes. And the, all the undulation there was just from manipulating um, the tension. So using, purposefully using different textured yarns and materials um, adjacent to each other in those shapes. So if you look at, you can look at my Instagram and see the progression of the piece. So on the loom, it did look different. Like it looked much more taut. It looked, it didn't have that aliveness, but I knew as I was making it that that would affect it when I took it off. So then if you look at like the later picture, you can see um, how it looked and it has all of those bumps and those just come from using different thicknesses of material and different types of material. Thank you. Um, and Sophie is asking, how can you avoid having fringes at the end? Ooh, yeah, tell me about it. <laughs> I don't like fringe. I use, sometimes fringe has its place. Um, if I do fringe, I do always do it after I do the body. I call this the body of the piece. And for me, the fringe would be like, putting your shoes on first when you get dressed. Like, I don't know what shoes I want to wear until I have my outfit picked out. So, so anyway, um, that is, yeah. I, so if you do want to play with fringe, it actually can be a really interesting way to balance out your piece or to add contrast, but I would recommend waiting to the very end to do it um, and seeing what kind of textures you want to play with that. Also, if you don't want to, you can just leave your piece like this with the little knots at the top and bottom and either just stick it into a frame. Um, I had one nearby, but it's not here. Uh, you can totally frame your pieces or just pin it to the wall or um, attach a dowel, sew a dowel to the top and just hang it that way. Uh, so yeah, you definitely don't have to um, do fringe. Hide the do. Um, yeah, do you want to answer that real fast? I'll answer that quick. Um, so you can use a thread and needle and sew your, uh, your warp loops back the back side of the piece at the very end. So kind of like if you knit um, how you would finish an edge or like a hem stitch kind of a thing. Yeah, and I wanted to say everybody, if you wanna either DM me on Instagram or send me an email, if you have any questions or want a follow-up, you know, mentorship or anything, I love to talk to people. So reach and out. And Kat, what is the best way of getting in contact with you? How can people keep up with you? Where can people find your work? Oh, yes. Good question. Um, definitely on Instagram. I hang out there a lot. <laughs> um, yeah. So if you want to get the quickest response, reach out to me on there. If you want the most in-depth response, maybe email me. Um, and I also am always happy to do like more FaceTime or Zoom with somebody who's interested. So, and you can find me at Kat Howard, K-A-T underscore Howard on Instagram. I also have a website, which I'm trying to redo. So uh, yeah, find me, follow me and reach out. Thank you so much. And thank you everybody for participating in this workshop with the Level Up Project. Um, I am so thrilled that you are all here. Um, once again, you will be receiving a link to this workshop, which has been recorded. You'll be receiving it about a week after session. the session one ends. Um, as Kat said earlier, if you didn't get a material box and you maybe want one because all of these things are so cool, mm -hmm. I would say probably email Kat and you can likely purchase something um, from her in a bit. And again, if you get on our mailing list for the Level Up Project. Um, we will be doing this again later this winter and also Kat teaches workshops separately. So thank you everybody. Um, yeah, some soothing balm after, yeah, after <laughs> some sad news tonight. I'm so glad that this did that for you, Meg. Um, yeah, and thank you everybody for being present and coming and uh, listening to me and everything. So, and yeah, just uh, being present. And if you ever have questions about the content creation side of art work too, I love to talk about that. I didn't really get to get in as in depth. So anytime, just reach out. Thank you everybody so much. Um, I hope you 
enjoy the rest of your weaving. Uh, and we would all love to see photos and videos of what you've just created. Um, if you'd like to share them online or via email later. Um, yeah, <laughs> please at me. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Um, everybody have a great night. Uh, thank you so much for coming. Happy weaving, everybody. <laughs> <laughs>